All right. So um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thrilled to be here um, after uh, so many years of um, being at API Days very early on and missing out on a bunch of these great conferences and now really happy to be back uh, in our home city here in San Francisco. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about the forests versus the trees. That's the only explanation I have for this title. Um, so th you're going to hear an incredible amount of, of interesting technology uh, these days, not just about APIs and API specs, but API implementations and service meshes and API security and really, really interesting topics that are happening. I actually wanted to start us off um, with a little bit of an introspection. Um, just for a moment, ask ourselves, oh, safe harbor, that's the thing that flew by. Uh, ask ourselves, why are we here? What actually brought us to this place today? Think for yourself, why are you here personally? What, what is it about APIs that's worth throwing a conference about? Why is it that everybody in the world is talking about APIs? And by everybody, I just don't just mean technologists. I mean like BBC. Why is everybody talking about APIs? What is the thing that makes that happen? Why are we so excited about it? And what do we, as thought leaders and as path pavers, need to keep in mind so that this momentum that we're all benefiting from and, and enjoying actually sustains and, in fact, goes faster? That's what I wanted to talk here about um, versus all of the technologies um, and so on that you will hear in, in the rest of this conference in the next couple of days. So the first question is, or the first question is, what brings us personally here? And I would vouch that most people are here because we love tools. We love to build things. We like to assemble. There's something inherent. It's, it's what cho made us choose this particular career to go and build stuff, right? And that's an inherent love and, you know, never lose sight of that. And even though the tools may have gotten a lot fancier and the things that we play with may not be physical, you can't cut wires so much anymore, but that's still the thing that's going on underneath. However, what we're really doing, if you take it a little bit more seriously, is we're in the business of automation, right? We're in the business, and the reason why APIs are so exciting is because it allows us to connect this thing to that thing and automate. Arguably, everything that we do in the world today could be done by people manually, but the whole point for hundreds and now tens of years in the API world is to automate, right? That's just keep that in mind. Okay, now, why is the business so interested in it, right? Who is funding all of this thing? Why is this actually changing uh, the way that businesses work? And I, I would argue that the first thing is leverage, right? This ability to go and piggyback on top of something that somebody's already done and build on top of it is an incredible enabler. That's the first thing. Second thing that happens is that when you look at any particular producer of an API, the return on your investment is amazing. And that can be internal. I built a shared service. That can be external. Hey, I'm able to monetize this capability. Or, hey, I built this thing, and now some partners come and built their business on top of me, and I'm getting the rewards for that. So that combination of leverage and ROI is really what's fueling this API economy. So with that said, there's an interesting aspect that we often lose track of when we talk about, in general, sort of API economy and open APIs and, and sort of uh, programmable web and all of that, which is that this is fueling um, a revolution inside of companies as much as outside of companies. So inside of a company, what you'll often want is you'll want, um, you, you want cost savings, right? You'll want to go faster. You want to deliver innovations faster. And the mechanism that companies are doing this increasingly is they say, I've got a bunch of APIs, and I've got a bunch of back-end systems that I put APIs on top of, and I hook them up together, but I end up producing new APIs, and I check that into sort of an app store. And in that world, I've got capabilities that I built for the last project that I can leverage for the next project. And so they do that, and they spin up more capabilities, and maybe it's new projects, but they still end up checking that API into some app store effectively. And then as this keeps going, right, they see that they're going faster and faster, so they invent faster and faster, and they end up changing the clock speed of the business, going faster as a company, innovating faster. And that's the number one thing that companies are interested in and therefore are willing to fund. And this notion, something that, that can be viewed as, as a network of applications, right? Just like you have a computer network where all the pieces are interoperable, so at the application level, all these capabilities become interoperable because there's APIs in front of them. You can discover and you can consume and so on. That concept is something that we're starting to see now, not just inside of companies, but as companies start to work with each other, 
you start to see these application networks converge. That's not a surprise, right? They will often use the same services, or they will partner with each other. Uh, if you're in the enterprise space, two of your customers are probably already working with each other. So in that way, these application networks start to converge, and we can start to see the beginnings of really a new global architecture, not just APIs in terms of economy, but an architecture that is collaborative, that is competitive, that evolves very, very quickly, that is merit-oriented, just what we'd want to do for distributed architecture. It mirrors very much the web, but at the API functional uh, level, at the automation level. So with that in mind, where are we heading to? What happens when we actually see more of that happening in a business context? And I wanted to take a perspective for a moment from the consumer's eye. This is the, some of this is already there. We will see more and more of this, and it's something that I like to call coherence, how these various services. So imagine that you're sitting in your office and you're not feeling good, right? Where things are going is, all of that not feeling good has been translated into digital signals. And something is warning, hey, you've got a fever, or you've got some issue coming up, and that should be able to then align with both your calendar and the calendar of, say, local medical providers to say, hey, there's a doctor that can actually see you. And when that happens, you should be able to then align with a rideshare API that will book you the trip to actually get to your doctor. And when you get to your doctor, all of the APIs in front of medical records should align and bring a unified view, basically, to the doctor. It shows you a patient 360. You should see all of your information. And as the doctor is now very efficiently and correctly prescribing something for you, and you head back, your prescription is being sent over to a local pharmacy. And that pharmacy should be able to check that against, again, your medical records exposed through those APIs, and say, hey, this is the right thing to actually dispense to you. And there's no reason they can't then keep going with that API for couriers and deliver that medication straight to your office. They know exactly where it is that you live, so that within two hours of not feeling good, you're already administering the medication. That's a coherence along these directions that's really only enabled by APIs, right? To do this manually would be prohibitive, but we can automate that, and the cost to do this is arguably no bigger than the regular cost to, to, to do any service, and if that's true, that changes the economy. Uh, there's something called the coherence economy that I think is gonna start emerging, where once consumers get used to this, they never go back, and businesses have to now serve things at this level, and that's what ends up changing the economy. So I'm gonna leave this as a thought to you and go back to what part do APIs actually play in all of this? So we have tended over the last few years to talk about APIs as products, right? And that's really what the business understands. That's arguably what we should all be thinking about with respect to APIs because we are serving our consumers. Our consumers might be the team next door because we're doing microservices, but there's still a consumer in mind. And so if you're thinking about your APIs as products with a consumer orientation, you're making sure that the API capability behind the API really is valuable. You're making sure that it's reliable so people can actually build on top of this thing. Remember, all of this is actually behind the API. The API is in service of something bigger. And the third thing is that it's actually a delightful consumption experience because it's so painful to consume yours, they'll probably go and find something else to do. Okay, so we're all used to thinking about that in the last few years. I would argue we should be, we should lean in more. We should think harder about this and go for something that's a little bit more prescriptive than this. We should be thinking as productized building blocks because we know better. We know that those APIs don't stand alone. We know that they're weaving together and we know that one stands on top of another. So if you were to look at it in this way, you would use three different words over there. First is it's gotta be simple. It's gotta be the kind of thing where if you're looking to assemble something, it's pretty clear to you that this is actually a simple thing, that it's utilitarian, it actually serves a purpose it fits right there into the chassis between the piston and the uh, whatever the parts of the car are today, because I've got an electric vehicle, so it actually changes a little bit. And the third one is that it's well-bounded, that it doesn't try to do everything and probably fail at all, but it's actually trying to do one thing. If you're hearing microservices, yeah, that's the same mindset. It does one thing and one thing well. That, I believe, is the mindset we should have towards APIs, and we should keep in mind that that's what I want to speak about today. So I want to do it by example. So I've chosen... Uh, a, a domain, an area that I think everybody understands. I don't need to explain how banking works, so I don't have to go into insurance or healthcare and so on. Everybody's done commerce, and in fact, even though I'll be talking in the language of e-commerce, these concepts have not changed for several thousand years. The Babylonians would probably recognize most of this stuff, at least at this level. So 
I'm going to talk about the domain model of e-commerce as an example here, and focus first on the semantics. Fancy word to just say, let's agree on what we're talking about. That's actually really, really key. A lot of us love to jump towards execution, but if we can start by just agreeing on what the actual concepts are, you preserve that utilitarian aspect all throughout. So let's talk about that. First concept, an order. An order has a recipient name, a recipient email. An order is a business transaction that has happened. Very straightforward. If you were to pop it open, there would be a lot more fields inside, but it's really important to establish the notion of an order. And when I say establish, it's not just a box. It's actually a file, which you can't read here probably, but trust me that there are properties inside of that order that correspond exactly to these things. And the point about being a file is that there is data here. Okay, it's metadata, but it's still data. You can store it somewhere. You can put it, in fact, in a graph database and go and query what's inside of that. So we're treating very technically this notion of a domain model. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. So I add an order, then I add an order item. There's a relation between them. Nothing particularly special. And very quickly, I say, surely somebody has done this before. Maybe not the Babylonians, but somebody else must have already done something like this before. Why do I have to invent all of these semantics? Arguably, if I can find a bunch of semantics that everybody already agrees on, I can align with that. I can save myself work, and everybody in my business can be talking about exactly the same thing. So I go to one such place inside the sales domain. I'm going to import stuff from a place that already captured all of these semantics. If you go to schema.org, it's already got all of this stuff in there. So why don't I just borrow from that? Borrowing, by the way, is a good thing. It's not something you have to ask for uh, apologies for. Right? Borrowing is actually really, really good. So I'm going to go to schema.org and discover, wow, they've thought through all this stuff. OK, so I'm just going to pull in some of these things from schema.org. I've got an offer, which is technically the thing that you actually do when you say to somebody you can buy something. In fact, I've modeled warranty. And there's more and more things there. So I'm like at a party here. I'm just borrowing more and more stuff. This forms commercial transactions, but there's more stuff than that. There's also who am I? Who is my buyer and who is the seller? Are they an organization? Are they a person? All that stuff's done for me. I can just pull that in. And there are related things. There's the products in the inventories. And on the other side, there's how do I get it to you and postal addresses. All of that I just slurp right in because now I have a general, like effectively a universal domain model to describe those things that are going to eventually come up as APIs. So I start with that. And I need to zoom out a little bit. You'll see why a little bit later. The thing just gets big. So think about all of these as business entities, right? Here's the organization and the party inside of this kind of party folder, if you like, the commercial transaction and so on. So I've modeled my domain. I've established uh, what it is that I'm talking about. And this is something that business people and technical people can actually agree on. And remember, it's all technical. And as I go through, I will now be creating data. And we're back across all of these domains. Okay? So this is a really important exercise. Again, it may feel like this is just philosophy or what enterprise architects do, but the reality is that establishing early on what it is that we mean will stop the misunderstandings before they make it down into the service mesh, and it's pretty hard to fix. Okay. All of this is encoded in files. And the next step is now I need to deal with the data. Right? So I've established the meaning. What does the data look like? So let's start again with this domain model that I had before. I'm going to focus on just the pieces that I need right now. I'm not going to try to boil the ocean on all of this. And I'm not trying to come up with some kind of canonical schema. I'm just going to do something that actually works for my particular API right now, for my business need. So I'm going to focus on a few of these uh, domain models and actually instantiate them as schemas. So order and order item. And then I'm going to take the postal address and generalize that into a mailing address, because again, that's a schema that I want to capture. And it's pretty much one-to-one, -one, but this is the technical domain. I may need to actually add some new properties to it for technical reasons. And these other things that were in my domain model actually get embedded inside these schemas. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. In fact, there will be lots of variations of these schemas for different people. That's OK. We're not trying to be canonical about the schemas. We are trying to be canonical about the domain model, the meaning of these things. And I need to add a little bit more, so I take in a payment from another place. And then I add a couple of things that don't exist in my domain model at all, but are necessary for business processes. So I need to know what a shopping cart actually looks like in terms of data. And when you're actually doing a checkout, which is an intermediate state, I need to capture that as well. So that's the relationship between the domain model and the, and the actual schemas. And we'll do a lot with those schemas. 
and there's relationships between them and so on. I won't bore you with the details. Hopefully, you're getting the gist of this thing. So I've got my domain model. I've got my data model. And by the way, data is a great way to talk to the business, right? They'll understand the data aspect. They may not know the internals of APIs, but they certainly can talk data. And now I need to figure out what am I going to do for the APIs. And there I have a choice. So there's lots of things. And we'll see in this conference, there's lots of ways to actually go to the next step. I'm going to start with one that you actually see very often, which is, hey, I've got my data. I know I'm going to talk over HTTP. What do I do? So one way to do that, Java. So I take the schemas that I had before. I generate the Java representation of schema, in this case, POJOs. And now I need to start wiring the stuff up together and adding the capabilities to this thing. So I'm going to add here a post, the ability to create something new. And then I'm going to add a get to be able to get the thing that I added. I'm going through this fast so you don't try to read this. And a put so you can modify it. And yeah, if it looks like there's a lot of work here, there's a lot of work here, right? Not nearly as much work as having to literally code everything in assembler or something, but it's certainly a lot of work. Having said that, this is what you need to do if you're going to just manually create an API out of the data schema that we already have. Once you have this, though, you're in pretty good shape because you can generate an API specification. Now, this will become a contract with your consumers. This is super important. I know we're going to talk a lot more about this. This one is an open API. It captures all of that uh, API that we just modeled out in code. And once you have an API spec, that's great. Now you can generate uh, UI out of this thing. You can generate SDKs out of this thing. You can create a portal. You get a lot of advantages once you've gotten to that step. You say you don't want to do it this way. You want to use GraphQL. Great. Same idea. And again, we're going to hear more about this in a little bit. In GraphQL, again, I effectively generate my schema in GraphQL speak using their data types. I won't go through all of that detail. But when I do that, I can then start to add the actions. And in GraphQL, that means that you actually have to implement the resolvers. So I start with basically a scaffolded list of all of those resolvers. And I start to say, you can do this, and you can do that. And it's all still attached to the schema, but you had to kind of put it together by hand. It's not bad. It's actually much better than we used to do. But I think we can even do better than this. Now, we can talk about, is GraphQL different than REST or not? I won't have a lot of time to say here. What I would encourage you is look at all of this, understand how it all relates to each other, then make the choices that you actually need. And what I'm going to try to do is show you how it all relates to each other. So let's go back. Oh, and one other thing you get out of GraphQL, like you do with the others, is once you've actually captured it in a specification effectively, then you can generate the tooling out of it, right? Then you can actually create queries and browse the results and explore the, the API that you've generated to GraphQL. Again, once you've crossed that threshold, this is really, really compelling. And it's still attached up to our schemas, and it's still attached up to the domain model very explicitly, but you had to kind of wire together the actual API side by hand. OK, so can we do a little bit better than that? Instead of just plain encoding HTTP, we can actually start to encapsulate patterns, pre-created models, and then attach to those and get our APIs to be a lot more consistent, a lot more straightforward, and by the way, a lot easier to implement than what you saw before. So if we do that, here is another expression of our data types, exactly the same schema that you saw before. This one is with Ravel data types. Just makes it a little bit easier to actually read what it is that we've done. And we're going to start to capture those patterns, those repeatable patterns that we want to do, inside of a reusable library. So here you see, for example, the general behavior of any collection. Any collection, I should be able to retrieve it. I should be able to create a new thing in that. I've captured all of the HTTP-ness inside of these reusable patterns. So when I'm creating new APIs, I don't have to relearn HTTP and maybe make some mistakes, but I can actually get consistent APIs flowing out of it. And so with that, my API specification looks like this. Much simpler than it was before, much more obvious what it is that I'm doing. I've got shopping carts that are a collection. And here's their schema, whether you're reading them or writing them. And then here's a particular item in a shopping cart. And here's its schema, and so on and so forth. So in the end, I've got a simpler, a more concise description of what my API is. And I take that, and again, I've got to generate UIs out of this thing. I can generate my open API schema out of this thing. All the other tools that I saw before are still available to me in a more concise way to actually do that modeling. So a lot of people will go and do that. Can we do better? Well, yes. The more 
opinionated we become, the more prescriptive we become, the more constrained we become, the more straightforward we can actually attach to that simple model that we had at the, at the beginning. And REST seems to be the best fit for that. It's not, um, as, as I will argue, it's not that you're going to do REST and you can't do everything else. You can actually do a lot of things on top of REST, but if you attach that RESTful domain model directly to your, uh, that RESTful API model directly to your domain model, you will get a cleaner, more utilitarian API. Let's see what that looks like. So let's go back here to my schema. And I'm going to remove the relationships for a moment because with REST, the most important thing to do is to establish what are the resources in your API, right? And you do that here at the, at the data model level. So I'm going to take a few of them, and those are the resources that I actually want to expose in my API, right? I'm not writing any kind of code. I'm literally just saying these resources have URLs attached to them. That's the first element. Once I do that, all these other things get folded into those resources, right? Just like we saw before. So they're still there. They're just not directly exposed. They're encapsulated inside of these resources, inside of their properties. And once I've done that, then I need to move them around a little bit. So I'm doing this to show you that I'm not losing anything. This is like one of those card shufflers. It's all still there. I'm just moving it to a different place where it's a little bit more convenient. Because what I need to do is I need to add a couple more things to this uh, model, which is collections of things. So anytime I have individual things, I always will need collections. So I'm going to add those guys. So there's the shopping carts collection, and there's the checkouts collection, right, to just aggregate lists of these things. And that's actually all I will need with respect to resources. Because at this point, I can simply apply REST to this. I simply say there's a uniform interface that you always do exactly the same thing. Every time you have a collection, you're always going to be getting it or creating something new inside of it. Every time I have a, an item inside of a collection, I'm always going to be doing exactly these kinds of operations. These operations have a meaning inside of REST. I can just tag them with which meanings do I actually want to expose in my API. It's, it's no harder than this. And what's even more interesting is the actual transitions between them. So now these aren't entity relationships, one to many. This is the way you move from one thing to another. So your business process is actually encoded in here. If I want to check out from a shopping cart, this tells me declaratively that I need to post to a checkouts collection and create a new checkout. That thing when you say checkout and you're sitting there and you're verifying your orders, OK, that's encoded right here. I don't have to write anything else. REST just gives me this out of the box. That's really, really compelling. So I've now achieved the domain model and the data model and a very direct attachment of the APIs to my data model. And before you say, yeah, this is another one of the 10-year uh, philosophy talks about REST, I want to show you this is actually real, right? And it's very straightforward to actually do. Take that same model that we had before and simply add annotations, a very set of prescriptive annotations that you stuck inside of some library so that everybody else can say, yeah, this is what I meant by REST, and you attach them. So for example, in here, I simply annotated. I told the system that this thing is, in fact, a resource of type checkout, and that this thing uh, in terms of general resource type, is a member of a collection, right? So now there's no argument about this. You don't have to read some documentation. Any API client can discover that this thing is a resource and can knows what to do with this kind of thing. So for example, it knows that these operations, the read and the update, correspond to get and put. Otherwise, somebody would have had to write that and make sure, did they use put or patch, or what did they actually do? It's actually encoded right here in the metadata. It's completely declarative. Similarly, with all of the Hadeus, all of the transitions between things are actually declared for you inside of this. So REST is just a pattern on top of our existing API specifications, and it can all be made real. OK, so we think we're done with APIs. Of course, this conference tells you we are not done with APIs. There's a bunch more stuff to do. Because everything that we've done so far is sitting on top of HTTP with request response, but that's not all there is out there. So systems can talk to each other asynchronously through notifications, for example, right? We all get that on our iPhones. And we know that IoT out there is feeding tremendous amounts of little bits of events. They're not waiting for you to respond. They're just feeding it in, right? Temperature, temperature, temperature. So we know that at least these things are important. But in fact, in any company, and in fact, in anything that you do, there are tasks. I need to produce PDFs. I need to generate something. All of these kind of offline tasks are important. And in general, the way companies work, and increasingly the way that we work, is through workflows. And these tend to be asynchronous. Something happens that triggers something else to happen, that triggers something else to happen. That's, that's built into automation, yet we haven't captured any of that stuff so far. 
And if you're in the world of microservices and you're thinking, you know, this is all, this is all um, a really cool new way to do things, and you're talking about event sourcing, well, that's nothing but a bunch of events that one of your microservices generates, that another one consumes, and it generates its events, and so on. So this pattern has got to somehow make it into our world of APIs. Let's look at that. So what is the general architecture here? These various applications are publishing events and subscribing events. Usually there's some broker in the middle, right? And before you, you think this is just enterprise messaging, Kafka is certainly a very good example of this. So there's something in the middle that takes the events and then publishes them, pushes them to the subscribers such that the publishers and subscribers don't have to be there at literally the same time. And there's different semantics. I won't get into that. But somewhere there's an API in here because these are applications interacting with each other. They're not interacting through request response, but they are interacting with each other. You can make this application do something by publishing events to it. So there is an API somewhere, and we should capture it. And the question is, where is that API? It's kind of a, a where's Waldo kind of thing. So here, it's very clear where the API is. It sits right on top of the application that actually answers the requests. But where's the API here? This is actually a contract between publishers and subscribers. So there is really a contract. It's kind of this distributed contract. Right now, it's implicit. And my urging, and I think where we're going as an industry, is to make that explicit as an evented API, as a contract between publishers and subscribers that has all the benefits of an API spec that we attribute to request response kind of interactions. So an easier way to envision that is when you have only one publisher, which is the case much of the time, not always. In that world, you can just move that up underneath here, and now you can say, hey, this is an API that's exposed by the publisher of the events. It kind of controls the shape of these events. And that's why it's good to associate it with that. So if that's the evented API, where's the evented API spec? Well, we'll get there in a moment. Remember, we're not going to start from that. We're going to model it inside of our domain. So now we're adding something new in our domain, purchase completed. That's a business event. Business people know what to do with that. Everybody can agree that that's what it means, no matter what the data is. And at the data level, we can add payment created. And what's interesting about capturing that data, so far, this has just been about static data. But now, with events, we start to see the temporal aspect. We start to see the business flows in the data level. That's really interesting. How about at the API level? Well, we can add, right in here, at our declarative API level, a new thing, a publish and a subscribe. That's actually really the way the world works. When you go to pay for something, you go to the credit card, and you kind of give them your information. And then at some point, they give you back a token, and you go and publish this to some listener that goes and verifies that the payment is there. And then you subscribe to, hey, did the order go through? And then you find out. So that's the way to reconcile all of these different capabilities. Now we need a spec. And for that spec, I want to invite on stage Fran Mendez, the creator of Async API, which is an emerging spec that it's, it's worth your uh, paying attention to. Uh, just like RAML, just like OpenAPI, um, Async API tries to capture all of those interactions right here. All right, Fran, come on up. Your Thanks up. for inviting All right. me. Thanks. So, Thanks for the invitation. Sure. So, um, uh, how many of you are familiar here with uh, OpenAPI or RAML? Uh, let me see you. <laughs> okay, so fair enough. Uh, cool. So, as, as Uri was saying, there was a missing part here. We were used to define uh, request response interactions, but not even driven interactions, right? So, I uh, created the uh, async API specification, which is pretty much like an open API. And as you can see on the arrows on top, um, you get channels. Uh, channels are uh, this information, like uh, th these events, like a uh, payment created, right? Things like that. And you can define there the, um, the interactions, like for instance, it says channels, checkouts, checkout ID, payments, publish, message. And it means that this application is going to publish a message into the checkout, checkout ID, payments channel. And you can find there the payload is a RAML, it's a RAML object, right? where the, the information about this event is defined. Same thing for the, for the, the one below. Um, thanks for that. So and, and before, uh, mm, uh, before I get into this, uh, we're launching soon in September 
uh, version two of the spec. And this is one of the cool features that we want to highlight. Um, can you, ah, thanks. Um, so these are traits. These are inspired by Raml traits from MuleSoft. And this is a cool way to reuse um, parts of your, um, of your API definition. And as, uh, as Yuri was saying, like you, you can um, put it aside and share it with, uh, with the rest of your company. So it, um, it helps you Im improve um, consistency. That, that, that's the word I was trying to find. Consistency across your organization, right? And this, in this case, for instance, uh, we have in this example uh, common headers. So in, in event-driven communication, as in HTTP, you have headers as well as, as, uh, as, well as a payload. And we always have some set of common headers that we don't want to, anyone to miss, right? So you can declare there that please use these headers and you don't repeat yourself all the time, right? So uh, just to make the connection here, um, all this information that is referenced there, payment right and order, it's coming from, uh, in this case, a RAML library. So you have all the, def the data def defined on a, on a RAML file. And that leads me to the other cool feature that we're launching soon is uh, support for uh, any schema format, any YAML or JSON schema format, like RAML, like JSON schema, of course. Um, like uh, Avro, for instance, with Kafka. Uh, this is, a, I think it's a good example because many people in event-driven uh, world is using Avro. Um, and as Yuri was saying before, out of the left side, you get the right side, right, generated, so you get human readable documentation uh, just for free, really, it, it really quick, and without you having to worry about the details of, the details of things, right? So, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think this that's is the last the, one. It's the last one, yep. yeah. So, okay. thanks, thank you. Uber, for inviting, thank and thank you. you. And it's great to have the world of events come into the world of APIs. So, um, I wanted to leave you with a couple of takeaways, right? I've talked through a lot of things, right? There's some ways to, mo to follow through this. So one is, if you're actually looking for the content that was all there, you can go on our GitHub and just look at the models, and we'll be evolving that over time. There's nothing official about this. It's very, very scrappy. There is actually a mechanism to pull all of this stuff together. Um, created something called the Anything Modeling Language, right? Which is a way, really, to model any kind of domain. You can find it out there on a.ml. It's all open source. Uh, please come in to contribute. Um, if you want to contribute at this level, it's relatively deep. It uses all these W3C technologies. Uh, if not, um, just wait for the outputs of all of this to come out. And it will allow you to model all of these domains and then some. You can model Kubernetes in this. You can model a lot of things. So um, hopefully the slides will be distributed later. So I want to leave you with one last thought. And that is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. And as you go through the following days, and you, you listen to all of these amazing technologies, and you get deep down into the implementations and so on, try to strive for that simplicity, whether it's at the domain model, or at the API model, or at the patterns model. And if we don't get that simplicity right, we're going to be drowning the way the last wave of APIs, known as SOAP, drowned. So that's what we want to avoid. We want to actually keep leaning into this thing. And as we actually find that simplicity, we're going to be able to get everyone aligned around this and get all the leverage out of the APIs. So with that, I want to say thanks. Um, we have five more minutes for questions. And uh, maybe invite Kay back up here. Thank you. Thank you, Uri. There's room for questions now. We've got two microphones in the room, one here, one there. So I can see nothing. Questions? Raise your hands, please. Ah. Somebody should invent an app for this. Uh, what is the way for the existing APIs, which are already designed in uh, OpenAPI, uh, to transform into this uh, uh, new structure, right? So how complicated would the journey be? I want to understand it from Yeah, you. it's a great question. So you might have uh, an API already uh, captured as an API spec. 
typically in open API. Um, in many cases, the API is implemented and it's not even captured in any kind of spec. But do you leave those out? Not at all, right? So first thing is, if you've already gotten to an API spec like open API, you're more than halfway there. Um, and the way to capture it is you could well, keep it as open API, but you can also actually translate that uh, through AMF to something else. And if you want to come up with either the next version or you don't think it's consistent enough and so on, you can actually output that in one of the other formats. RAML would be an example. And go ahead and remodel it um, and then go back to the open API when you need to actually publish a new version. So all these things are really very interoperable right now. Um, and if you ping me later, I guess my slide is off, but if you, if you contact me, I'm happy to connect you, or just go to um, a.ml and you will actually find links from there. And th that's a really critical point. Like, We're not in the business of replacing everything. We're in the business of making everything interoperable and making sure that new things are even more consistent than, we were be than they were before. Any other questions? There. In uh, what you showed, how do you handle one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships between these entities? Uh, so since I have many layers, uh, there's different kinds of things. So in the schema uh, thing, it's, it's exactly how you would have thought before. You literally, there's a way to encode them inside the files. Um, it's not different than, for example, the way you would have done it in ER diagrams. That notion for the data pers uh, perspective is completely uh, typical. In the REST world, there you're talking much more about transitions, right? Um, so it's modeled through collections. When you have a collection of something, that's the, that's the many aspect. And then you have transitions between these various states. Not completely sure I'm understanding the question. Um, and I, do you still have the mic? Yeah, so, uh, so the whole purpose of this is to automatically generate the REST code from yes. the data models, yes. right? So I didn't quite follow when you showed the uh, you know, the, the schematic, how that would work. You know, right. If I have two entities with a many-to-many -many relationship, does it automatically create an intermediate mapping entity, yeah. or how does that work? Yeah, so the, for, the, for the server side of that, right, when you're actually generating the, the APIs, there's nothing fundamentally different at the API level. The API level is still a contract at the HTTP level. But it's now got extra information that can be used either by the implementation underneath or by the clients, right? So the clients have a very declarative way of navigating through this and understanding what it is that they're actually encountering at that moment. From the server implementation, you can use that. And I don't think there's that many tools today. Uh, so this is a call for the community to go and take that metadata underneath that and actually generate scaffolded implementations based upon the relationships that, that you've established. There are tools already for scaffolding out pretty well at the data model level. And the data model part is no different, again, than it was before. But as far as the API model goes, when you're doing those transversals, I don't think there are that many tools out there that are well developed. We've got Any one more question, question here. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I think uh, we have covered uh, the data definitions and models, but there are also business rules governing how the data gets in and gets out. Is the metadata definition, uh, which was used in RAML, capable of delivering those business rules out to the client so they can expect what to, how the APIs would behave? Some of the business rules, yes, and some of the business rules, no. Um, and I think the, the really interesting thing about business rules is you don't actually want to expose all of them on the front side of the API. There are many things that you want to abstract out for two reasons. One is it's kind of none of the client's business and how you actually do that. So for example, when I, create the, the, um, when I create a payment, what are the business rules about verifying and so on? Obviously should not be in there. But the other reason is because if you do expose all of the business rules behind the scenes, you'll end up coupling the client to them, and that's actually pretty hard. Having said that, there are business rules that you actually want to explain. One of the business rules is obviously what are the business flows? So what happens from here to here and so on? You do actually end up reflecting that in that RESTful model, and as much as possible, those should be um, conventional, right? So there's no, there's no big surprises in there. For the parts of business rules that have to do, for example, with validation, right? So uh, the amount of this order must be above this and so on. You can actually capture those in, in your schema rules um, and, and put constraints on them such that those parts of the business rules are actually at the data model. Um, and then there are other business rules that have to do with when you do this, this happens. And when you do that, that happens. Kind of a workflow se uh, set of business rules. You often see those inside of companies. Those are particularly interested because so many of those are actually uh, event-based. 
And when you have the async API specs across lots of events, you can bring them back, recreate the choreography that's actually happening there, and effectively, in that way, announce what the business rule actually is. So there's lots of levels of that. Thank you. So a big applause to you, Uri. Thank you. Thank you very much.